is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Welcome to worship this first Sunday of Lent. We are thankful that you are choosing to worship with United Presbyterian Church in Goldfield, Iowa. As we begin our service today, I just wanted to remind you that if you want to join along in our Lent scripture reading, we are reading through all four of the Gospels. Um, we, according to our plan, should wind up reading all four of them completely by the time Easter gets here. If you want to join along with that, you can go to our church website to the blog. I'm leaving a little, just a little bit of a reflection every day, and you can find the readings there. I also would be glad to email you a schedule of what chapters are assigned for each day. We do hope to return to worship in person starting on March 7th. So this service and next, next week's service um, will be the last two that are online only. Once March rolls around, we will continue to post an online service, but we also hope to be back in our sanctuary. As always, if things change, we will be responsive to our context, our community. Um, we will keep you posted if anything changes with that plan. For now, though, let's continue with our morning's plan. Let's step into a time of worship. Here our call to worship from Psalm 25. Show us how you work, God. School us in your ways. Take us by the hand and lead us down the path of truth. Mark the milestones of your mercy and love. God is fair and just. He corrects the misdirected, sends them in the right direction. He gives the rejects his hand and leads them step by step. From now on, every road you travel will take you to God. Follow the covenant signs. Read the charted directions. Let us worship God. Worship His holy name. 
We come to God knowing who God is and knowing who we are. We trust that the goodness of Christ would overcome our sins and our faults. Let us take time to confess our sins before God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us when we forget that we are already claimed by you, loved by you, and purposed for you. Forgive us when we allow ourselves to shape and be shaped by voices and words that do not bring life, create life, nurture life, sustain life, or resurrect life. Merciful God, help us find our way again. Turn us back towards the road spotted with your other pilgrims, wayfarers, and repentant servants. Remind us that your way is the way of returning. Amen. Now our declaration of forgiveness from 1 Peter chapter 3. You know, even though God waited patiently all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved then, eight to be exact, saved from the water by the water. The waters of baptism do that for you, not by washing away dirt from your skin, but, pre but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone, from angels to armies. He's standing right alongside God, and what Jesus says goes. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Almighty God, open our heart, our mind, our eyes to the beauty of your word. May we hear just what we need to be nourished and empowered to take a few more steps in this journey. We ask, Lord, that you give us a generous spirit. Remind us to look to Christ as an example and call out to us, helping us to hear your voice. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading today comes from the book of Genesis, and it's what takes place after the familiar Sunday school story. We have grown up hearing the story of Noah and his ark. This is what happens following that. This is Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, as for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Mark. As I shared last week, Mark is a gospel that gets right to the point. It's very efficient. The story moves quickly. So listen today as we hear Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 15. We will uh, meet up with Jesus as he approaches John to be baptized, and we'll see what happens as that takes place and immediately afterwards. Mark chapter 1, 9 through 15. 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Think along with me for a minute. How many contracts have you signed in your life? How do we as a society use contracts? Loan documents, mortgages, leases on cell phones, wedding licenses, bills of sale, employment contracts, service agreements, terms and conditions, buying things with a credit card. We could talk about the social contract too, giving up some independence and freedom for the good of everybody. But let's focus in on what we know about written contracts. Usually with a well-written contract, the terms and conditions are spelled out clearly. Annoyingly so, right? The really tiny print that nobody reads before they sign a document. Essentially, both parties are agreeing to abide by what's on the paper or what's on the screen. There's agreement. The document may or may not hold up in court, but it's important to have it in writing. That's what Judge Judy has drilled into me over years of watching television. <laughs> we live in a contract world, but our scriptures today invite us into a covenant world. We sometimes mistake a covenant for a contract, but it's dramatically different. It's certainly theologically different. A covenant is initiated by God. God is the one who offers up the covenant. God is the one who puts it into place. God is the one who dreams it up. God then draws it up. God puts it into terms that God only can honor. And that ensuring of the covenant also falls on God. This is very God-centric, if you will, but God invites us into this covenant agreement. This is all on God. God promises to fulfill the terms of the covenant. He brings the terms and conditions, but ultimately the weight of it is God's burden to carry. So what does he promise here as he makes this covenant with the rainbow up in the sky? Well, to appreciate what he promises, let's rewind just a little bit. The world at one point had grown so awful so full of sin, so ungodly, that God sought to wipe the slate clean and start over. It was his right as God to do so. I struggle with this, I do. Wiping out humanity because people did things that God knew that they would do. But God is God. We don't get to understand everything. We just study and try to figure out the pieces that we need to know in our lives. So the flood, right? The ark, Noah builds an ark, loads up his family, and they get into the ark and seal the door, and then it rains and rains and rains, more rain, so much rain. Eventually the rain stops, and then it's still several more days and weeks and months before the floodwaters go down enough that that dove sent out can return with a branch in its beak. And now we're caught up. God makes a promise. He offers a covenant that the earth will never be destroyed by water like this again. And he places a beautiful rainbow in the sky. Somewhere the rain was added to that phrase or word rainbow. 
Scripture just refers to it as a bow. In fact, the Hebrew word is very similar to bow as in bow and arrow. Definitely a tool of war, a weapon. So in this Genesis passage, an instrument of war, the bow, a symbol of fighting, an instrument of death, is repurposed for peace. The death and destruction of the flood is in the past, and now God hangs this bow in the sky to remind Noah and future generations, and also to remind God of this promise that there will be no more death by flooding across the whole world. This is a blessing. This is a gift of life. This is a promise made by a holy Holy God. I'm not going to take time for a detailed summary of everything that happens between this scene with Noah receiving a covenantal promise and the scene we get when we fast forward to Jesus being baptized by John. Mark would approve. Let's get to the point immediately. <laughs> immediately. Pretty much that in between time is a cycle of people disobeying God. God grieving and getting angry, people repenting and turning back to God, God reminding them of steadfast love. It goes on and on. Anyway, towards the end of the Old Testament, we have a sense that the skies have closed up. Rainbows might still appear, but the tribe of Israel is pretty sure that God is done with them. The exile has taken its toll. The people are clinging to fragments of faith. They're weary, they're tired of waiting for God to fix a broken world. But then, enter Jesus. Jesus shows up, Christmas comes, Jesus is born. The Son of God is the Son of Man, God in human form. John has been sent to prepare for this moment. He is told to prepare the way. And today we read that Jesus is baptized by John. It's Mark. We don't get the full story of Jesus walking up to John and John saying, I'm not worthy to baptize you. We just know that Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan. The cool part of the story that we get in the Gospel of Mark is, is one word, uh, one phrase in the English. The cool part is that when Jesus comes up out of the water, the sky is torn apart. This phrase, tear apart, the Greek word is schizo. And it's not an accidental tear. It's not like, oh no, I ripped my sleeve on a nail as I walked by um, a wall. <laughs> it's not a little tear. This is a dramatic rip. It's loud. It's significant. The sky tears apart. Schizo is used one other time in the Gospel of Mark. It's used in chapter 15, verse 38. When Jesus dies, the curtain on the temple is torn open. Schizo. You know, a sky had a bow and a promise, and then it seemed like the sky, that communication channel between God and God's people, was closed. But here in this moment, when Jesus is baptized, he comes up out of the water, the sky tears open, the dove descends, and God has followed through yet again on promises made century before. You see, it's a covenant, not a contract. But if you're stuck in that contract mentality, and how can you not be if you are an American, we operate so much on contracts. If you're stuck thinking of this being some kind of a contract between us and God, God loves us as long as we don't sin, that's the contract. If you're stuck in that mentality, I need you to wrap your brain, wrap your mind, wrap your soul, wrap your hope around the fact that God puts up Jesus as collateral. God in human form. Jesus is the collateral if you're thinking of a contract. Jesus fills in for us when we can't meet the terms of an agreement. I've wondered sometimes why Jesus even wanted to get baptized. Why did he need it? I mean, don't you? We think of baptism as this holy bath or shower. Water washes away the dirt of sin. 
so we can be forgiven. And I think we think of it in an individual sense. Like God is here for my baptism. And we miss the communal sense of baptism. We celebrate a young child being baptized, as we should. We welcome people into our family of faith. But do we think of it as a holy warranty of sorts? Should I be calling people and saying, it's time to renew your warranty, come back and dip your fingers in the baptismal font? Jesus hadn't sinned, and he wasn't going to sin, so why did he need to go to John? Everybody else was going to John to repent. Why does Jesus need to repent? John probably wondered that too, but Mark doesn't take time to dwell on John. Some research suggests that as John baptized people in the Jordan, they weren't fully dumped. They didn't go all the way under the surface. But Jesus did. Jesus went all the way under. One scholar even puts it this way. Jesus wasn't baptized by the river. Jesus baptized the river. Jesus goes underwater repenting of all of the sin that has ever been and ever will be done. And he emerges to a schizo sky, torn apart, a dove descending, that dove being a reminder of the Spirit of God at work, that dove being proof of God's presence in someone's life. It's a reminder that when God shows up to honor his covenant, he brings a holy begotten son. What God promises in the Old Testament, what God promises to Noah, is fulfilled in Christ. We repent. We name sin. We do everything we can to stop sin, hopefully. And then we turn our lives back to Jesus. In that, we are part of a bigger picture. Part of the full people of God. Part of a family group that includes everyone that includes Christ leading the way into a promised covenantal future. Today, we are reminded that we can trust God. We do our best to be faithful and follow, but we do so knowing that when we don't measure up, Christ makes up for our shortcomings. God tore the sky, tore heaven apart, schizo, to speak this truth about Jesus Christ. He said to Jesus, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. God is pleased in Christ. Christ brings that sense of holy pleasure into a relationship with us through the Holy Spirit. And then that dove, so the dove shows up, proof of God's presence. We have the Holy Spirit here in this story, and then the Spirit immediately drives Jesus out into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by Satan to spend time with the wild beasts. What love is that, right? It's not always easy. It's not always fun. It's not always a celebration. But Jesus goes under the water and comes back up so that the heavens can part and and God can be here with us. And then once that presence of the Spirit is fully in Jesus, he goes out into the wilderness to prove what that Spirit can do. Jesus fends off temptation. That's a beautiful story, too. We get more of that in Matthew than in Mark. Um, but I love the way this passage from Mark ends. Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent. Believe. Trust that the God, who is the God of the rainbow in the sky, is the same God that shows up in the person of Christ to honor a faithful covenant initiated by God written by God, and fulfilled by God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our confession of faith today comes from the confession of 1967. This is just a paragraph, just a small part of a greater confession that reminds us what we believe as a denomination, as people of faith. The Confession of 1967. By humble submission to John's baptism, Christ joined himself to people in their need and entered upon his ministry of reconciliation in the power of the Spirit. Christian baptism marks the receiving of the same Spirit by all people. Baptism with water represents not only cleansing from sin, but a dying with Christ and a joyful rising with him to new life. It commits all Christians to die each day to sin and to live for righteousness. In baptism, the church celebrates the renewal of the covenant with which God has bound his people to himself. By baptism, individuals are publicly received into the church to share its life and ministry, and the church becomes responsible for their training and support in Christian discipleship. When those baptized are infants, the congregation, as well as the parents, has a special obligation to nurture them in the Christian life, leading them to make, by a public profession, a personal response to the love of God shown forth in their baptism. Amen.
Your charge this week is to mull over the meaning of covenant. What does it mean for you personally that God took the initiative to reach out to you with love? What does it mean that Jesus came and was baptized and did all the things he did for us, for us, and now receive your blessing? May God be above you to bless you and beneath you to hold you up. May the Holy Spirit go in front of you to guide you and be behind you to prod you along life's way. And may Jesus Christ be alongside you as your best friend, your savior, and your dearest companion. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.